Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Man, am I excited today. I've got a guy on here by the name of Ed Squire. He is involved with the Me Too What Now, which has really touched my heart because it talks about what now, and that doesn't happen very often. What do we do after we've had epiphanies, after we've had expectations? What do we do now? And it affects so many things. So I'm really excited to have him on the show, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. He's just to go off on this tangent a little bit further about him. A year ago, he started the Me Too What Now to raise awareness about childhood sexual abuse and mental illness. And he wanted it to be mainstream and contemporary in his approach. He developed a niche for creating videos and documentaries that are capturing the attention of his target audience and other advocacy groups, writers, filmmakers, and social influencers. One of his current projects is producing a documentary about the public lawsuit he filed against one of his abusers, who was his elementary school teacher and the school board that employed him, which really touches my heart, and we'll get into that with Ed. But it is my pleasure to welcome Ed. Ed, could you tell us your story and how this got started? Oh, man. Well, thank you so much for having me on your show. And I really appreciate you highlighting the what now part of uh, what I'm doing. That's really a big thrust behind my mission is to not be stuck in the, okay, this happened to me because we've heard so much of that in our culture for the last few years. And our culture wants to know where do we go now? What happens next? And so I'm all about how are you doing and are you getting better? And how's your health? And are you moving forward in your life as opposed to whose fault is it? And what's out of the movement that I'm on? You're talking about healing. I'm talking about healing. That's all I want to know. If people ask me my opinion about Brett Kavanaugh or Bill Cosby, I stay away from them because I just want to know how are you doing in your path to recovery? Because really my opinions on those things don't do anything for me when it comes to getting better. And I'm, I'm still in the recovery process myself. And I would rather get better than get caught up in uh, these various uh, movements that are taking place. And they're not all bad. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's where my focus is. And that's what my nonprofit focuses on is getting better. And uh, although I'm not a certified, qualified professional healthcare professional, I consider myself a certified, qualified recovery person who can speak into that. And that's a a big part of recovery. So tell us about your experiences with that. I mean, uh, I know that you filed a lawsuit against the school board and the teacher that abused you as a child, which to me is uh, people really don't realize how much in our school systems abuse goes on. They really, really don't know. Yes. And it's the statistics around it are mind boggling without breaking it down into just the school system in Canada alone. There's, which is where I'm from. There's an estimated 10 million survivors of childhood sexual abuse in the United States. They estimate between 60 to 70 million survivors of childhood sexual abuse. That doesn't include survivors from maybe colleges or the workplace, which is a big part of our culture today. And And it's just from that one statistic. But what happened for me was, I think a lot of survivors do, you know, my my story is is horrible and it's sad and it's tragic. It it really did destroy the majority of my life. And um, I tried to forget about it and think I was okay. I I did the typical man up, get over it. And just uh, don't let this thing hang over your head. You're bigger than it. But I didn't understand the depths of the psychological and physiological damages that it does to you in the developmental periods of your life when you're growing up, and they will stick with you. And eventually, and this is what we hear a lot in our culture today, which I'm glad, is that adults are experiencing triggers or events that are taking place that are bringing them back to the abuses that they experienced when they were a child. And all of a sudden now, you have Brett Kavanaugh cases, you have my case, and you have the uh, women's Olympic gymnastics team case coming up. And all of a sudden as adults, so something is happening in our brains to cause this to happen. It's not a, people aren't making it up all the time. I say that way because there's always a small percentage of people that are faking and lying and making it up. And that's not what I'm here to talk about. And even with the uh, Neverland case, uh, with the documentary that was on um, HBO recently, those boys were triggered later on in life themselves. That brought them to work with that director and put together a documentary. For me, 
I was a uh, consultant for Fortune 500 companies for you know, 15 to 20 years. And I consulted in the United States, Canada, and Europe. And I consulted for global companies like Boeing and PepsiCola Global and pharmaceutical companies, just really big, big companies. And it was like operational improvement and industry best practice standards for their operations. And I went in and did analysis and design and created structures for them. So it was, that's what I did. But beginning in around 2012, I started to lose my concentration and I began to uh, slowly fall into depression. And I mean, I was making good money and I was living what I thought was a wonderful life. I, and I just, I was angry. I just began to have this anger come up within me and, and things would trigger me to cause me to have what are post-traumatic stress disorder, anger outbursts, outbursts of anger. And they were extreme. And so I went and eventually I took time off and I, I told my employer that I think I'm having a midlife crisis or something here. You know, I think maybe I just need to take some time off. The stress of my job is a lot. I travel and everything. And come to find out, I was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety and depression. It took no time at all for my entire healthcare team to point it back to uh, childhood sexual abuse. And um, another thing happened at that time, because, you know, it's funny how life happens. Life seems to just happen... I don't know how it scripts itself, but around the same time, I got a phone call from a childhood friend of mine, and uh, she and her brother lived down the street from me, and uh, her name is Heather Young, and Jim Young is her brother's name, and Jim and I, we used to play together all the time, we went to elementary school and high school together, and he committed suicide when he was in his mid-20s, and I was living in Florida at the time when I heard this, and I ignored this news, and I think being far away, because I was you know, living in Florida, I knew why he had committed suicide, because he was sexually abused by the same teacher I was, and we were molested at the same time, countless times. I just knew that that's what he had done, and I was right. So she had contacted me in 2015, and she wrote a book, and it was called uh, Fireflies, Finding, uh, uh, Shining Light in a Dark Place, and it was her memoir that documented her efforts to try to prevent Jim from committing suicide. And a big portion of that book was documenting the abuses that she knew that uh, her brother was experiencing to the best of her knowledge that she had heard stories of and that her brother had shared with her. And when I, when I read this book, she contacted me, like I said, in December of 2015. And she said, look, I'm, I wrote a book about Jim. I'm going to be releasing it. And I would love if you would come to a book signing event and come and share your story of what happened with this teacher and support Jim and my release of the book. And I thought, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer was yes, that's where I was going. But I, I paused in my thinking for a minute there, Art, because really what happened in my mind was like, I don't want to go and talk about this. And it was, she wanted me to do it in front of my, home, my hometown. Right? I, wow. I, mean, I would love to say, oh, Heather, I would love to go and do that. But my initial thought was no. Can't do it. Don't have the time. Uh, my schedule is busy. It costs too much. I mean, I, I came up with every excuse, but I thought about it for a few weeks, and I thought, you know what? I uh, I need to do this. You know, I need to do this for Jim, and I need to do this for Heather. I need to do this for myself. I need to do this for other boys, and nobody else was speaking out. And this took place over a period of oh my gosh, I don't know, ten years. This guy molested, I don't know how many boys, but he molested ten years worth of of high of, of uh, elementary school boys. So I say all that to say that these events really started to trigger me. And that's what eventually brought me to a place where about three weeks after I went to uh, my hometown in Canada and spoke at that event, that I came back home to Denver and uh, I found myself unable to work, unable to focus. Una I just could not work. And that's when, uh, that's when I got, I went on disability for post-traumatic stress disorder because of childhood sexual abuse, which is a very difficult leave of absence and disability to get to get covered for, but that's what I got. So that's how it started. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. 
Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. One of my thoughts were, how did you go about healing yourself? What were your expectations and what epiphanies did you have? That <sighs> were, that brought you? I mean, have you thought about that? Well, yes, I thought about it a lot. Art, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I completely unraveled in my life. I mean, everything, you know, I, I just, it's incredible how I used to think that I was okay, right? I mean, I'm okay. I mean, look at the career I have. I've been married for 13 years and, uh, you know, I have good friends in the family. I'm successful. Uh, can't be that bad. But the reality was, the truth of my story is, when I was uh, in my late teens, I was youth leader in my local church. But at the same time, I began to experiment with buying sex, right? So I would go to church, and then I'd go buy sex afterwards. And, and I can't tell you the splitting, which is actually a psychological term, right? The splitting that takes place in your brain when you, when you do that. And I continue to do that through my entire life. And I continue to do that through my marriage. I continue to do that through my career. And I thought it wasn't a problem. How could you possibly think that is not a problem? Men are very good at segmenting their brains. <laughs> yes, we are. And we, and we think we can control everything. So we got it under control. We got it under wraps. And you don't realize that if you think you're not hurting anybody but yourself, you're wrong. That was one of my epiphanies to find out that how could I possibly be hurting anybody if nobody knows? Well, I didn't understand and realize at the time that, that if I'm engaged in those kinds of activities and lying and being deceitful and living a double life, I'm closing down a part of my heart and my life and my personality and my authenticity to every single person, even strangers. And so I'm denying relationships with people on an intimate level because I'm not who you think I am. So that was one epiphany. Can I stop you for a second? Because I want to read something to you that is taped to my computer. Sure. And it's about procrastination, but it actually has, I think, the same roots as what you're talking about with lying to yourself and altering your expectations. And it goes like this. It's called Don't Delay. And it's by Richard O'Connor, Dr. Richard O'Connor. And it's called Procrastination is a Way for Us to be Satisfied with Second-Rate Results because we can always tell ourselves that we could have done a better job, only we had more time, et cetera, et cetera. If you're good at rationalizing, you can keep yourself feeling rather satisfied this way, but it's a cheap happy because you're whittling away your expectations of yourself lower and lower. That's what lying does to when we lie to ourselves and we don't live to our core expectations. You know, what we expect of ourselves, we start whittling away little by little, at who we are. And then what happens is, once we've whittled away our expectations, then we don't live authentically. And we have to start living to the expectations of others. And once we start living to the expectations of others, they control us. And when they control us, you've got to do a lot of work to get out of it. So I am a professional at that. (laughs) Because what develops out of this is codependency. What develops out of this is performance orientation, splitting of your personality. And then if you throw in bipolar and ADHD and PTSD on top of that, there's no possible way you could become authentic if you don't understand these things. Mm -hmm. And like we were talking earlier, it's it's only been in the last few years that I came to a point where like, I was like, who the hell am I? Like I I used to, I journaled, I, I began to journal back in about 2007. And so many of the pages I journaled, I just wrote down, who am I? And so that, that's the epiphany. I? That's the epiphany. And what you did with it relates to the same thing that we're talking about. Because yes. what do you do next? What do you do? Very few people, very, very few people do what you did. And that's take it. And that's what I'm interested in. Because that takes a really incredibly strong, special person. God. And your faith. I, I don't feel that way. You understand that, right? I don't feel like an incredibly strong, special person. No, I'm sure you don't. But I feel like don't. a survivor, right? I mean, I feel like yeah. I'm just, I, I have done what I needed to do to not kill myself. 
But see, you had to have faith and hope. Faith, yes. faith that you could come through it and hope in the future. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's the things, it becomes a mindset. And once you have a mindset to be aware of your expectations and to realize these epiphanies that we have, because a lot of people just think that epiphanies are just bang, they hit you in the head. No, epiphanies come to you every day because epiphanies are a precursor to your expectations. They have I totally to agree. I, and I love that. So I, 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 I live that every day now. You know, I mean, I, I literally am living my dream. That's how I feel. I, you can ask, you know, I, I couldn't ask for anything better right now in this moment, right? Mm-hmm. Other than what does the next moment have? No, Jim Carrey, I like, he has I a saying that. that says, he says, every moment you live is pregnant with the next. Oh, it is. It, I mean, yeah. it, there's such a truth in that. It's so difficult for people to live in the moment, but you do that through having the expectation that your moments count, that the moments count, and they lead up to minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and pretty soon you start, you know, we were talking about how young I look, you know, you don't believe. (laughs) Yeah, well, you do. (laughs) But you know, it's because I, one of the things that Vietnam taught me and being abandoned as a young child and not the traditional abandonment way, was that I learned that every second counts and that I am in control of it. And through all the things that I've been in my life and have gotten through, I've always, and you don't know my story, but I'll I'll give you a little bit of it. When I was nine and abandoned, I went to a hilltop and had a conversation with God. And I asked God, what is going to become of me? I was laying on my back on this hilltop above this dilapidated, run-down house that my sister and I were living in almost alone. And I asked, what is going to become of me? And I heard a voice inside of me that said, you just have to be faithful and keep going, keep doing. Hmm. And I had to learn to figure out everything on my own because my parents weren't the type of parents that taught us anything. They didn't give us advice or any of those things. They did in some ways and they did in others. And I loved them dearly, but they, their parenting skills were not good. After many, many trips up that hill, I began to believe in that voice. And I trusted in myself that I was the master of my universe. I was the one who controlled it. What I'm going to say to you is that you are the master of your universe. You have your epiphanies and expectations. And when you honor them and become true and faithful to them, it takes away the anxiety. It yes. takes away the depression. It takes away that PTSD because you become your authentic self. So my suggestion always is to when I work with people who are depressed or PTSD, you know, I have a lot of friends that from Vietnam and the Marine Corps that suffer from PTSD and have lived lives just chained to that Vietnam War. People ask me, how did you get away from it? What's the difference in you? Why are you always so happy about things? Why do you always have this glow about you? It's because I've always had the expectation that the next moment is going to be better. Everything, no matter how bad it gets. And I've been through some ups and downs. Just That's so so interesting. And I spoke at Harvard. And when you have people say to you, you're living almost like such inauthenticity. You don't find people like you very much. You know, there's not very many people that have had the epiphanies and had the experience that you have and have been able to verbalize it. And that's why I am so honored to be able to talk to guys like you who have been through these terrible ordeals in your life, but it doesn't define who you are. Ed, you are Ed Squire, who has so many great talents. When I hear about your videography, And all the good things you're doing in life, that is the purpose that you were put on this earth for. All those events that you went through brought you to being Ed Squire in this moment and being able to change the people that you choose to are in this world. Totally with you. I said my piece. (laughs) <laughs> this is about you. I didn't well, mean no, that. No, it's, but, you know, our, because we haven't had a chance to connect a lot before. And, and it, this is nice. I'm, I'm glad you shared that because it brings us to a closer connection, right? On this podcast, and on this recording, but also as friends. 
And it's what I live for right now. It's like I live for connecting with people that get it, meaning that they're authentic selves or that they know that they're in the fight to find that. And they may not be there yet, but they're desperate to get it and they will. And like I say, even just a few years ago, we never would have been able to have this conversation because I would have been trying to act like, yeah, I've got Mac together. Yeah, yeah, I went through all this. I would have told you all the same story, but I would have come across like, oh, I'm fine now. Everything is great. And I'm so excited for me to what now. And, and I am. Those are true. But the reality is I still struggle. The reality is I still, I'm still going through it. And it's okay because it's that's okay. part of the journey, right? It's all part it of the is, journey. It is. But I, I love the fact that it's interesting because a couple of things you said that really struck out to me. And, and you said you always knew all your life that, that better was coming, right? And for me, I never felt that way. I always thought my life is crap and I mean, I can make it look good. People have always thought, you know, my life was great. I, I have done lots of exciting things and make it look good on the outside. But on the inside, I was so self-loathing because of what I was doing. I would never believed I would ever, ever get out of it. And it was funny, you know, one day my sister said to me, how can you, she was like, I don't know everything you're up to, but I know you're up to something. She goes, I don't know how you can do that. How can you continue to do what you know is not good? And, you know, yeah, I told her, well, I can't stop, right? Because everything for me was, as you know, was self-soothing. Everything was fight or flight. Everything was about performance. Everything was about what do you think about me? And I could not stop long enough. I'll never forget with my ex-wife now because our marriage didn't make it. I'll never forget one time we went to therapy and the therapist, who was actually my therapist today, thank God, she said to me, she goes, you know what? You need to learn to live in the moment. You need to learn what that means. And I was like, what do you mean I need to learn? I said, I'm in the moment. Rock on, man. I'm in the moment. Let's do it, right? Like, mm. I thought that's what living in the moment was. <laughs> like, like, and then um, I had another therapist say to me, she looked at me and she heard me talk and talk and talk about all my problems and how terrible everything was. And I stopped and she looked at me and she just was dead silent. This long pause. And she looked at me and she goes, you know what, Ed? You need to learn how to just be. Here, let me give you something, Ed, to chew and on. I was baffled by that. I want to give you something to chew on. Start believing that in the possibility of everything. Oh, I do now. <laughs> right, I'm there. I'm all in now. I understand this now. I get it. Like she said, you need to learn to be. I'm like, be? I'm like, what do you mean be? I am being. How much more being? If, if I was dead, I wouldn't be being. I'm alive. How can I not be being? She just looked at me. She goes, you don't know how to be. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I've, I've learned, I mean, I've learned what that means, right? And, and, and uh, yeah, I, meditation is a big part of my life. And if people ask me, what's the number one thing that you attribute to your recovery? And it's, there's no question that it's meditation, which is a miracle for someone like myself. Mm -hmm. Because it brings you inward instead of That's outward. Right. Once you go into yourself deep and you become mindful of what is deep inside you and what you expect has so much to do with it because your expectations, you've got to be true to those core expectations you have. You have to be able to identify them and know what they are. And once you start doing that, people have to understand how transformative it is once you start expecting. Let me give you my basic belief. I believe that our core expectations were given to us by the grace of God, that he implanted it in every man, woman, and child. They know no color no religion, they know anything, they are purely ours. The one thing that you can count on in your life, the one thing that I had as a child that I could count on was how I expected. And once you learn that how you expect influences your life, and when people tell me, oh, oh, I don't expect, or my therapist told me not to expect, I go, it's impossible. You cannot expect because every single... I challenge people all the time. Tell me one thing that you do is that is not based in an expectation. We don't act without it. That's right. That's a good point. You can't avoid it unless you're, I don't know, in a coma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, you said something that really struck a chord with me that where, where I, I really relate to you. When you said, back to when you said you had an expectation that things would get better. When you cried out to God and you said, what's going on here? What happened for me was in, in 2012, it was actually August 20, 24th, 2012, when I was drinking and taking prescription medications and in depression and, and, and working, I was in my hotel room one night and I was so angry because I just hated my life so much. 
and I was began to experience panic attacks. And I went to my hotel room that night and I threw my phone across the room and I started yelling and swearing and cursing at God. I was saying, you know what? If you can make the planets and make the animals and make everything that's around me, I said, why can't you do something for me? I mean, give me a break. You know my life is a pile of crap, Lord. Let's be honest here, right? I am a complete waste of space, right? Let's be honest. So if you're there, which I know you are, why don't you do something, all right? There was a lot of expletives in that dialogue, and I didn't care. But you know what? I come to realize that God, he doesn't care. <laughs> he loves you. <laughs> That's right. Loves so now, I didn't realize at the time, but I look back now. I know now, I didn't hear anything like you said, you, you felt or you heard an encouraging voice. I heard nothing. I was just angry. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I didn't, and nothing changed. My life got worse, actually. I ended up losing my job. <laughs> I completely unwrapped over the next uh, six or seven years. Yeah, and I think- uh, looking back now, I know that he was saying, you know what, Ed? I have been waiting for you to say that. I've been waiting for you to ask me. I've been waiting for you to say, you know what? I can't do this. So buckle up, son, because it's going to be bumpy for a little while, but I'm going to get you out of this. And that's what he's done. And so I believe the same thing. And and it came from an expectation. I wanted it. I didn't know how to do it. But that that deep desire was there. And I believe it's planted in everybody as well. And it can be interpreted in different ways by different people. I don't care how you interpret it, by vibrations or by through Buddha, through whatever. But God is there and has designed that in everybody. And uh, I can't deny that because, um, I mean, look what's happened. There's no question. You have to be receptive. It's kind of like just being in this space and being void until you become receptive to what you're open to. That's why I said to you, believe in the possibility of everything. Because yes, every, yes. Every, everything becomes possible then. And you don't have to hit rock bottom. You don't have to go through deep, tragic things either. You know, yeah. You just have to have that. You have to exercise that gifting that we all have. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. Do you know what, Ed? There's people who have everything. You would look at them and say, they've got money, they've got looks, they've got this, they've got that, they've got this beautiful life, and they're miserable inside. You know why they're miserable inside? Because they don't have the expectation that their life is beautiful and they don't have it yes. surrendered themselves to the point. I, I worked when, when I was young, I was a counselor in a mental health, health facility. I used to volunteer in the free clinics in Long Beach, California. And at the time, uh, heroin was just starting to come into the system. And I became a counselor to heroin addicts. And we had a girl come into the clinic one time that came from an extremely, extremely wealthy family. I'm telling you, it was unbelievable. She was going to college. And this is in 1970. Her monthly spend that her parents gave her was five grand. Oh, my gosh. Every month, they deposited five grand. She drove a beautiful car. She lived at the beach in south of Long Beach, in Seal Beach, California, that an apartment had overlooked this beautiful place. She had everything by every account of what you would call living the dream. You're making you happy. Except she was unhappy. And she took that unhappiness and turned herself into a heroin addict. And beautiful, long blonde hair, blue eyed, hmm. gorgeous in every sense of the word. You California 
beach girl that you would just fall in love with. And I started working with her and we actually started, it was really the first time, and I didn't know it at the time, that I started working with expectations. But I started working with what her expectations were of herself and what her, how she was dealing with her parental expectations. That's when I started identifying that it's your expectations at the core of you that matter more because she was trying to live to her expectations of her parents and she wasn't doing anything that was making her happy. Oh, I understand. I, I get it. I get it. The, the, the reason, I mean, I was making uh, a very decent six figure income as a, consultant. But the only reason I did it was because, oh, I can make six figures doing that? And if you've ever seen the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, Catch Me If You Can, yeah, right? Saw. Where he just literally, they didn't have Google back then, but um, <laughs> if you can, so I literally Googled my way on how to become a high-end consultant in business technology for Fortune 500 companies. If I didn't know it, I Googled it. And I, because I, I can, I'm a good talker, this has been my gift. I got through interviews and got hired. And I kid you not, in the first few years that I started, I would have senior project and program managers pull me aside and ask me if I'd ever, have you ever done this before? And the reason why they were asking me is because they could tell that there's something wrong and I didn't know. And so I had to confess and say, well, I've done work like this or similar to this. Or, But the reality was I hadn't and I had to Google it. But my point is that it wasn't a passion of mine. I mean, it was interesting and fun. I mean, I got to work with some of the most influential CEOs and CIOs uh, in the largest companies in the world. I mean, that was fun and interesting and we got to fly around, but it's nothing I really wanted to do. I'm never going back to it again. I've gained a lot of skills I'm using now with my nonprofit, see, which is going back to our earlier conversation. Everything happens for a reason. It's just amazing because I failed high school. I didn't finish college. I'm a great starter, poor finisher because I've got ADHD to the max. That's just the way it is. I'm a risk taker. I act before I think. I suffer the consequences later. But through all of this, I now understand this, right? That's why I can have this conversation with you. And I can, my life is slowed down now. And I don't have to act and react. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. And I can design a future for myself, make choices for myself. And you know what? If you don't like me, it's okay. I don't have to be shocked and try to do something to get you to like me. And I mean, that is, I got to tell you, man, that is one of the biggest stressors in my life that caused me depression and anxiety was like, what are people thinking about me? Right. And how do I act around people? And now I'm like, I mean, let's put it, if you've seen any of my videos, I don't really care what anybody thinks, right? All I care is, is there somebody else that is suffering that's getting benefit from what I'm doing? That is the only thing I give a rip about anymore. And that's the thing that fires me up every day. And uh, I have a different take on doing it. And those what it, I'm going off on a tangent, but my uh, worship pastor, he told me a couple of years ago, he said, uh, not even a couple of years ago, he said, you know, he said, uh, you should journey your recovery on YouTube. I think that people would find it very interesting. And I said, what? <laughs> I don't know. I, that doesn't sound very interesting to me at all. And uh, I mean, I have massive fear of what people think of me. And I have all these mental health. How could you possibly think this would be a good idea? I think you have what it takes to be, a, it'd be helpful to people. And so I thought, well, I wasn't doing anything because I'm a disability. I'm just working on trying to get better. And so uh, I never worked a camera before either. And so um, I bought a camera and I sat down in front of it and I started doing what most people do and started talking into the camera. And then I found out real quickly, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, but you know, all right, if I can say, if I can go on this tangent for just a second, the whole reason why I'm doing Me Too What Now is because when I started recovery, I did like a lot of people. If there are 78 million survivors of childhood sexual abuse, and not even counting people that are suffering from other mental health issues. So we're talking yeah. 200 million people between the United States and Canada. That's a big audience. Huge. And so I went looking on the internet, like I am sure, and there's no statistic that can prove this, but because it's fearful and shameful, I know that these people like myself go on the internet looking for help and information. Because it's private and you don't have to talk to anybody. You can do it in the privacy of your own home. And you can type in, I've been sexually abused. What happens now? Or I've got depression. What do I do? And you'll be led to some fantastic organizations and nonprofits and people and influencers that are doing great things. But I found for myself that there were basically two types of content that were out there. One was information you could read on the different types of 
the five phases of recovering from trauma or what childhood sexual abuse, uh, how does that impact you, or reading people's stories. And then the other type of content was video where nonprofits or other advocacy groups were posting educational videos on what to do and how to recover. And then there were survivors telling their stories. And so all these things were good. But for me, I'm a very intense person and I like to be entertained. I didn't find it very entertaining and I found it depressing. And so I would go and look for other content that was interesting. And that's when my youth pastor, worship pastor and I were talking. I just said, you know, there's nothing on the internet that is like it's being produced in video format that is, I find, like that I want to return to again and again that is helping me in my recovery. And that's where our conversation started. He said, you know what? He said, you need to take your quirky personality and speak the truth like you are. Be authentic and just either vlog your life, just, just vlog it as a survivor. Or, and then begin to teach your experiences on how you've overcome the various challenges you've had. Because you've, had. you've got a crazy story that you're, I was sexually abused by my grandfather, my next door neighbor, elementary school teacher, lost to, friend that committed suicide. It's a compelling story. And if you tell it in your way, he said, I'm sure people would love to hear it. So that's what got me started. And then when I realized that video is such a powerful, exploding medium on the internet, and it hasn't, it hasn't even peaked out yet. They're estimating it by 2020 that YouTube is going to have a, another 500,000 users on there. And the, the number of views is just astronomical. And so I went on YouTube and I started looking there and I looked everywhere on the internet and I couldn't find anything on the topic of, well, how could you? Childhood sexual abuse and recovery from mental illness that was interesting, motivational, and inspiring. Mm-hmm. And even funny. And I thought, there are influencers on YouTube that are either really bad people <laughs> or really good people. But it's interesting because good and bad is defined by the individual. I may call someone good who somebody else calls bad and vice versa. So you can't define or stereotype anybody. They are what they are. And I couldn't figure out what is the common denominator that is causing millions of people to follow certain influencers regardless of the topic. Because the topic can be literally anything under the sun and people have millions of followers. And I thought, I found out what it was. It was their authenticity. Yep. If you're authentic and genuine and passionate about what you're doing, your channel could be all about scraping gum off sidewalks. And I'm not joking. There is a channel, but the different ways to scrape gum off sidewalks is made by an engineer. He's a street worker in San Francisco or something. And he's like, go through all the different ways you can do it. And he's got hundreds of thousands of views and hundreds of thousands of followers. But he's very authentic. Right? He's like, here's what I do for a living. My biggest problem is how do you get this gum off the sidewalk? Well, on this episode, I'm going to show you how you do it with this. And I thought, why not do that for childhood sexual abuse and recovering from mental illness? Why not do that? And so that's what inspired me to do Me Too What Now. And it's, I have the humor on my channel. I have interviewed other survivors and other mental health care professionals. And I'm beginning to put content up that is informational. And I haven't focused on that yet. I'm going to this year. And I'm making documentaries. And I'm just doing, I'm just doing my own thing. And I said to Aaron, my worship pastor, I said, you know what? I said, either... The reason why nobody's doing this is because it's a really stupid idea <laughs> or it's because nobody's doing it. And that's when I began to realize, Art, you know what? There is no other Ed Squire and there is no other Art Costello. There is no other, everybody's made individual like snowflakes. And so I really felt that this is my calling to go ahead and just do it. Just be yourself out there. You're in recovery, let her rip and let each moment happen as it happens. And that's how Me Too What Now got started and it seems to be working. You found your passion. You found what your passion is. It would not have happened if it, all the events prior to that had, had not See, happened. And that's the bizarre thing, right? And that's yeah. why it's so hard for survivors. Why did this happen to me, right? I didn't deserve this, right? Jim didn't deserve to kill. Would Jim have killed himself? Probably not. Or maybe, I don't know. But there comes a time when you do this deep inner work like we were talking about and you ask, why did this happen? And who am I? And what is my identity? And my tagline for Me Too What Now is find yourself, live yourself, give yourself. And on my website, I have a, a short video that where I explain what that logo means. And Me Too is, is the, the word Me Too is in, is in a black background. And underneath that, it says find yourself. So I did that on purpose because when you first identify, okay, yes, I was sexually abused, or even yes, I have a mental illness. When you finally come to grips with admitting that you have a problem, that's where you know Typically, you have an identity issue, right? That's a lot of what we're talking about is who am I? Mm-hmm. So that's, I call that, that's an area of darkness in your life. It's very hard. It's where you experience the dark night of the soul. 
or in my case, I had like calendars, months of dark nights of the soul. Well, they say you hit the bottom before you come back up. I Me, mean, I hit the bottom, and then I bounced around the bottom several times, and then I found out, oh, there's a, it's a false bottom, and it goes deeper. And it was just the darkness that you go through, and uh, figuring out who you are, and why these things happen to you, and how could this be fair? And when that it gets sorted out, then in my logo, it says, what now? And that's in white, with a white background. And underneath what now, it says, live yourself, give yourself. So once you begin to understand who you are and learn your identity and begin to accept what life has given to you with thanksgiving, I mean, I am grateful for my life. I'm grateful every day, every moment of my life. I never was before. Now I begin to live in that identity, live myself. And then when you start living your true identity, I believe then you will naturally have an outflow of your life where it gives into other people's lives. So find yourself, live yourself, give yourself. That's what it's so do, about. Do you know you just described expectation therapy? I did not know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Expectation therapy is based on a physics formula that I learned in physics that is identify, clarify, and solidify. It's what, it's what, uh, experiments when they're doing uh scientists are doing experiments it's the formula that they that they use to figure out the validity of the experiment and it's the expectation of it coming to fruition and it's called the formula of, of expectation it's actually a mathematical formula that they use well that's interesting because i came up with that because that's the path for recovery from ptsd there's essentially five phases that you go through, right? Which are like acceptance and then grieving. And then, the, and so I just called that find yourself, live yourself, give yourself, which is the same as the mathematical mm-hmm. equation that you're talking about. It's, it's yeah. a universal principle. It is. It? It, it actually yeah. is. Because it's based in expectation. <laughs> I totally agree. So, I had no idea that that, I mean, I've always learned. So here's the thing. I've always learned because I've, I've been success minded all my life. And like a lot of people, they wonder why they're, don't, they don't become successful. They don't really reach the success that they really want. And that was me. I knew all about affirmations and what the way, proper way to think and the things to do. But it has to get out of here and into here. That's the difference it made for me is I began to really believe it, not just say it and know it, but you've got to like expect it, right? <laughs> That's what it is. There's a power in it. Yeah. See, the, in expectation therapy, it's identify the problem. Clarify it with thought and mindfulness, and then solidify it with a written plan to move you forward that is actionable, where you can actually document it and keep on track. It's almost like goal setting. You know, you just... Yeah, that's so interesting. That's what your expectation therapy is. That's what your book is based on. Yes. Interesting. It's on that. So you can actually heal yourself. Yes, I I agree. When I lost my wife in 2006 to ovarian cancer, I was so devastated. And I know my listeners have heard the story over and over, but I I know you haven't heard it. But when I lost her for three years, I went into this funk that was just, I had lived such a great life and losing her was so devastating to me that I started drinking and chasing skirts and hanging out at bars and just not living the life that I liked. And my kids came to me and said, hey, dad, you've, you promised mom you weren't going to do this and, mm-hmm. and all those things. And I went out on the lawn of the ranch and laid on my back and had that conversation with God again. I heard him say, I've given you all the tools, buddy. Get off your ass and start doing like I told you. I got up from that and it reju- <clears throat> rejuvenated me like you couldn't believe. And that's when I started reviewing my life. And when I started reviewing my life, I realized I had these expectations. And then out of that, I started writing. And when I started writing, out of that came the book, Expectation Therapy. So, oh, you know, that's like I told you earlier in the show that I, I started journaling around 2007. And from then up until just really in the last couple of years, I've lightened up on it. But I journaled, I mean, I've journaled hundreds and hundreds of pages, and whether by hand or in my computer. But I have, I have documented just like years of what I went through. And a big piece of helping me in my recovery, and still today, is I go back and I, I review, I look at, and I read where my head was at and what was going on in my life and how I just 
difference in who I am now is hard to believe. If I didn't write them down, if I didn't get them out of my head, I wouldn't realize the progress that I'm making today because of that. And just the exercise itself is one of the number one things that they recommend in therapy. It's cathartic. And it gives you a point of reference to go back and look and say, this is how I was feeling at the time. You can see progress and you can see regression in those two. By documenting how you feel, it is, has so many benefits to people. And everybody that I work with, I suggest it. Yes. It doesn't have to make sense. It does not. As long as you it doesn't have to. <laughs> writing it down, you don't have to let an English teacher see it and go, okay, here, here, here. This is about you being authentic to yourself. Because that's that, right. the more authentic and the less you lie to yourself, the greater you become. It just it, and, but you know that's such a scary thing for people, right? To hear that. Oh. Hear that from you and me? Oh, just write down how you really feel, right? But I look back now, and there were many, many days where I would write, I hate myself, or my life is effed up, or it was just, I think probably the most dramatic thing I ever wrote was I took the pen, and I just deeply wrote a big scratch across it, and it ripped through the paper, and I put a date on it, and that was it, because I was so, I was loathing myself so much, I had no words, back to that page. And I remember how I felt and how lost I felt and how depressed I was and how suicidal I was at that time. And you know what? There was another page that came after that. And then there was another page that came after that. And it was ups and downs and ups and downs. And, but you know what? This is what it did over time, right? And here I am up here now. That slow grind. That's, That's right. Slow grind. And it's so worth it. It's so worth it. I would much rather, I went out for dinner with a couple of friends of mine recently who, and they hadn't seen me for a couple of years because I kind of, I've been hiding away. Guys, I've been going through this from from a lot of people, and and we went out for dinner, and and I was telling him my story, all this, and his wife said to me, she goes, "Man, it must feel so empowering to be so liberated. You're just not ashamed of anything." And out there, I thought, it is, it really is, and because the reality is, you know, she said, she goes, "I don't live that authentically. It's not like everybody has to get up on a podium and tell everybody what happened to them, Mm -hmm. but just to live." Whatever your authentic truth is, to whatever level you want to reveal yourself to people, and you said this earlier, it's a very rare thing to experience. And I wouldn't give this up for a Lexus or a Mercedes or for a fancy house or for a, or a, give me a big bag of money. I wouldn't want it. One of the things that I do when I start working with clients, sometimes if they can't start getting into themselves and identifying in a traditional setting, in an office or space like that, I'll take them out into where I went, a hilltop. Uh, Austin has some beautiful hill country around it that we can go over and lay out and look over the lake, but lay on their backs and just have a conversation. Oh, that's a great idea. That's one of my goals is to have a retreat where we just go. It can be, for me, like I told you, the water is such a, such a relaxing thing to me. I can go and sit overlooking a lake and just totally get lost in my thoughts. But I want to take people and really take them back to where they can really identify what they want out of life, what they want. Sometimes it's just to be happy, but happiness is not being able to say, I just want to be happy. It's deeper. There's something about it. I want to have a relationship with my spouse that is so close that we have no fear of telling each other and communicating, or I want to have a relationship with my work that is so passionate. I want to be an artist. I want to be a, a singer. I want to be a writer. I want to be, I want to be a computer programmer. You know, you know what that means to me? Art, when you say that, like if I was on a retreat with you and you were saying, you know, what do you want? And I used to say, you know, I want to be happy. And, and I get what you're saying because there's, so what is going to make you happy, right? And you know what, what you're saying to me is, is, is this, I want to live. To me, that's what living is. What does life mean to you, right? That's the ultimate goal that I'm hitting. Because once you realize that living is ups and downs and curves and yes, swerves, yes, once you relieve, yes. learn that and you live that, then you become authentic. Yeah, and I say that like this because that's just something I've. It's one thing I love about doing Me Too What Now is that like, I'm not doing it from a position of, okay, I have recovered, so let me teach you what I've learned, right? I am recovering as I'm doing Me Too What Now, right? And I've only recently learned that, you know what, life has ups and downs. There's no avoiding it. 
And don't try to avoid them. They're, they're there for a reason to teach you something, to make you stronger, to change you in a certain way, to direct you in, in a different way. Because what you think may not be the way life has for you to go. So you just go with it through the tragedies and the, and like, oh, just even, um, grasshopper. Um, grasshopper. That's right. That's, well. I'm telling you, man, I'm getting this thing. And, uh, you know, I had a friend of mine that I grew up with on the lake that I told you about in Canada where we grew up with. And, um, uh, on uh, April the 4th, he was actually at the lake with his family. He's got three kids, beautiful wife. He turned out to be a wonderful, beautiful man and a lot of friends. Just the type of person that's like, had many, many friends. That we do have power at, at the lake where we live and the cabins and whatnot. And the power was out. And so he went out to go check and see what was going on. And he got electrocuted and died. Oh. And with his whole family there, and the funeral was last Sunday. and so many people grieving for him, right? And uh, so many, so many, he had so many good friends and, you know, these things tear your heart out. But even when things are that bad, you know, it may not be a fender bender that you got and you're upset about, but when things are tragic, they st are still there for a reason. And, you know, and if you believe in God and you believe in something after, and for me, it's God, you know, and I, I know that Norm uh, believed the same. But he didn't go to church or anything, you know, but he just knew who God was and he believed in the God of the Bible. So there's this great peace in knowing that his family knows where he is. And, and then see, there's other lessons in life too, right? When it comes to religion, I hate that topic, right? And, I, and like, as a matter of fact, my nonprofit is a non-faith-based organization because I don't like, I don't bring my Christianity into it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to talk to me privately about what I believe, absolutely, but I don't. What I do is, like you, is I'm trying to help people find themselves. Because mm -hmm. I believe when you, in that process of finding yourself, you're going to find a higher power. And then when you figure out there's something bigger than you, then you're going to want to know more about that higher power. What's the truth behind that higher power? And uh, I believe that's what I found. Don't know which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So, what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. I want to give you a book to read. I'm going to give you some homework. It's a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. I don't know if you know Randy. I think I've read it. He's a boy that he went to heaven and came back. Is that right? No, 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 no. no. Okay. This, this is a, Randy is a scholar. Oops, sorry, uh, Randy Elkhorn, that sounds familiar. A, a biblical scholar. My pastor gave it to me and my wife when she was dying of ovarian cancer. And it's a description of heaven according to very strict biblical. I think I've read this book. It is a difficult read. You would know it if you read it because it is so difficult to read. Yeah. Because yeah, it's yeah. so, so Biblically technical. Yes. But the description of heaven is so. It's almost like science fiction when you read it. Is that right? Like, no. if I'm not mistaken. No, no, no. no? Okay. No. Well, then I'm going to, I'll check it out for sure. But, it, but it, it's a very interesting book, but it helped me realize some of the fallacies that we're culturally taught about the hereafter and what is biblically correct about it. So it's very, very interesting, but I found it very soothing and comforting. So it's a technical read. It's not a small book. This is not a 200 pager. This is like 700 pages. Of well, in all honesty, uh, I don't look like it, but uh, man, I've, uh, I've literally, I've read my Bible. It was, I lost count between 25, 30 times cover to cover. And I have um, tattoos. Now that's kind of <laughs> Greek and Hebrew tattoos yeah. on my arms because I've studied both Greek and Hebrew and I'm a big, big fan of uh, digging deep into the Bible and because I want to know what the truth about what it says. You'll love it. And, You'll uh, love it. And I get it. So I would, uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued by what you're, 
what you're telling me. And I, I know I've heard of Randy Elkhorn before. Yeah. Well, we're hitting way over time, but I want people to know where they can get a hold of you, how they can get a hold of you. I want all your background. Sure. I, I really appreciate that because the easiest thing to do, if you can't remember anything, is uh, all you have to do is hit record again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all you have to do is go to Google and type in Me Too What Now, all one word, M-E-T-O-O-W-H-A-T-N-L-W. And uh, if you just do that one word, I'm everywhere. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. If you go to YouTube and type in this is the same thing, you'll find me. Or you can just type in my name as well, Ed Squire, in Google or YouTube, and I'm, I'm just all over the place. That's how you can find me. So whatever suits you. My thing is videos, and I, I love creating the videos, and I, I, I drive everything towards that. But uh, my website is a good place to start to introduce you to what it is that I'm doing and, and how what Me Too is what now is all about. And I always encourage people, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on all my platforms. You can get a hold of me at ed at metoowhatnow.com. And if you're on Instagram and Twitter, feel free to direct message me and connect with me. I, I spend a lot of time. I spend a couple hours a day on average just uh, communicating with other survivors and other people in the community that are doing similar things to what I'm doing, because I'm certainly not the only one that's uh, you know, work in this area. And it's a great community and it's private. Like I say, I'm not a professional or certified counselor or anything, but on my website, if somebody is looking for that, I have, uh, you know, it's not uh, a complete listing of everything that's available, but, but there's help on my website if you're trying to find some help. And, yeah, I would look forward to it. And I would love it if people would subscribe to my YouTube channel more than anything, because um, not that I want to be a big you know, social media person with a lot of people following, but with YouTube's algorithms, the more people that are following and subscribing, then the easier it is for people to find me and the, the higher I, I go up on the search engines and whatnot within YouTube. So I, I really appreciate when people subscribe. I'll pay you a nickel if you subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I know. They may not know, but <laughs> it has been absolutely a pleasure. And I can guarantee you this, we are going to do it again. <laughs> I, I would love to. I would love to because I'm going to be releasing a documentary about this lawsuit. The goal is this fall, and I'm going to do a little tour of screenings in my hometown, three cities in, my, in the province of British Columbia, before I release it publicly. And uh, it's gonna, and I'll, I'm going to be recording that journey as well as I release it and, and speak at these uh, events where people get to see it in private before I release it publicly. And it'd be cool to come on and talk about what happens after that. Or anytime, give me a shout. I would love to talk with you more. We will do it. Folks, it's time to say goodbye again. I'm sorry, but you know where you can find me. Art Costello at expectationtherapy.com. You can find me on all my social media channels. And again, thank you for listening in. This interview probably gave you more insight into how to help yourself than anyone I've done so far. So for that, I am grateful. And with that, Heather White, please take us out and say goodbye to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.